thank you for joining us. Um, obviously, we would have really liked to present this in person at Kai, but times have changed. So thank you for coming to this uh, virtual discussion session. And myself, Pejman, Gunther, and Atia are just going to be talking a bit about our paper exploring the relationship between playtesting reports and the impressions of critics on video games. So a little bit of background for this work. Our real motivation here was that there's a lack of research published about the impact of games user research on the quality of published games. And this is for a couple of different reasons. One is that GER data for commercial projects can be very difficult to access because of not only NDA concerns, but a lack of organization, particularly for small studios and, and similar things like that. It's also really hard to describe what the quality or success of a video game is. There's lots of metrics for that, sales figures, obviously, uh, critical reception, reception from users, and, and so on. So our goal was to kind of study how playtesting can help identify issues that will impact the perception of a game once it is released by critics and users alike, particularly uh, for indie studios that have kind of a less structured user research division where it can be very difficult to deal with this relatively small amount of user research data that they have. There have been some similar works investigating uh, things like uh, the impact of player reviews on a game's reception, uh, the return on investment of UX evaluation and so on. So our study was consisting of basically looking at three case studies across three different genres. One's a collectible card game, one's a platformer, one's a top-down shooter. And the kind of timeline of this uh, was that the, the production of the games, including playtesting, occurred around 2015 to 2016. Uh, the games were released. Then uh, a few years later, we collected reviews for these games. We analyzed them. We coded them based on the features that reviewers commented on. And then we did a, a comparative analysis to see if we could basically find some relationship between the features that reviewers commented on and the quality of those features in the game and whether those features were identified as uh, potentially problematic by those playtesting reports that were done during development. So in a nutshell, what we found uh, and what we were really looking for was gaps between those playtesting reports and critical reviews. So essentially what features those playtesting reports missed out on, if you will, that were identified by critics as issues. And what we really wanted to see here was the role of playtesting methods and study design in affecting the coverage of a playtest. You can see why we're going uh, with this. We, we kind of noticed similar patterns in the other games that we looked at where the uh, shooter game, for instance, the tests that were conducted were focused on first time user experience. And a lot of the things that critics mentioned that were missed by the play test were related to long term play. So things like the variety of content or levels or game modes or story available, all things that obviously wouldn't be the focus of a first time user experience test. So what can we learn from this? Again, three small case studies, all indie games, all without any kind of centralized uh, structure for a user research division that would allow for kind of more rigorous playtesting and playtesting designs. What, what can we learn from this about playtesting design in general? Well, some of our key takeaways were kind of that features related to games core mechanics were discussed really frequently in game reviews. So playtesting should be advised to focus at least partially on kind of the quality of core gameplay mechanics or what's making a game unique. It's, it's not just about, say, player learning or first time user experience, it's about those core mechanics. And then aspects outside of those core mechanics can also be really important depending on the game. So if a game's intended for long-term play, content variety, which is something that you're not going to see from a play test that only spans a few hours, as we saw with the shooter game, can be really important. You need to consider how playtesting protocols will specifically address individual features. And we have some guidelines present in the full paper that relate individual playtesting methods to the features they can be best suited to address. We also, uh, in each of these cases, uh, saw that playtesting didn't focus on creative direction, things like uh, aesthetics, sound, and so on. And the importance of these features in reviews is really hard to ignore. When we were kind of coding these reviews, as we saw with game A, for example, things like sound can be really important to that critical reception when you're looking at the whole package of a game. And uh, the last point that we're kind of going to highlight here is that playtesting reports tend to focus on problematic aspects of a game. But when you look at the critical reception of a game, you obviously also see uh, reporting on positives and kind of what a game's core appeal is. So if we can report on these positives in playtesting reports as well, it can help developers to identify the features in their game that are kind of the 
the sellers, if you will, the things that critics and players will see as a, a draw to that game. And it may help them to kind of focus on further development of those features, polishing those features and validate some of the decisions that are made. So the crux of what we're trying to say here and what's elaborated more on those guidelines in the paper is that whatever uh, a developer or the research team is kind of focusing on as key areas of critical importance post-release, need to be the focus of playtesting pre-release. It can't just be about general testing focused on first time user experience or what have you. There needs to be a more critical analysis of what a game's weak points are and what potential uh, strong points that need validation will be. And then playtesting methods need to be tailored to focus on those strong points. So that's the paper in a nutshell. Uh, I think we're going to throw to the panel discussion now. Okay, I have a, a, a question. You mentioned, you know, uh, focus on creative direction. I mean, most often during our playtesting, we're, you know, maybe doing concept testing or we're doing usability tests. And so that, you know, kind of creative direction isn't really typically a focus. You said you had some guidelines on that. Uh, could you speak to that just a little bit? Because uh, it seems a, it's slightly out of, out of scope. Right. So, uh, so in the paper, when we talk about creative uh, direction, things like graphics, art style, animation, sound, and so on, uh, the suggested kind of methods that we talk about are a bit related to concept testing. So looking at A-B testing uh, earlier in development for things like different sound designs, art styles, and so on, looking at uh, having some opportunities in focus groups, maybe after, say, a playtesting session for a multiplayer game, making sure that some time is allocated to discuss things that relate to a game's aesthetics and creative direction. Obviously, for matters like this, you ideally like to have a much larger group of people to answer questions about art style because such things are so subjective that you want to have a larger group. For indie studios, obviously, this can be really difficult to do. So having a larger scale online survey, if it's feasible, uh, can be a good option. Otherwise, asking those questions, even in a small group, just to get an indication of what people's first impressions are is certainly better than omitting them entirely. One thing I would add here, regardless of the methods, I think one part that it was quite interesting for me was that, uh, you know, it's kind of also difficult to discuss those creative directions with the, with the design team, especially if you are the external party just, just evaluating their game. And also your playtest is not really equipped uh, to answer some of those questions. One, 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 one interesting discussion that sometimes comes up with, uh, with colleagues, uh, either on a user research side or a design side, is, is also how much uh, user research needs to get into uh, discussing that uh, the design direction or creative directions. Uh, some, some colleagues, uh, they think, uh, or they believe that uh, anything related to design and creativity should be left to the game designers or creative directors. But also some other colleagues think that uh, user researchers need to go beyond uh, just reporting the experience and also maybe provide some suggestions uh, in terms of how those modifying those 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 creative directions. So it's kind of interesting if uh, if if any of any of other participants here can comment on their on their view on this. From my experience and the way we work where I'm at is, you know, user research actually does have a direct role in providing suggestions in all of our reports for whatever issues that we're uncovering. So I think it would depend on the type of test. If it was a concept test, then that would be expected to dig into it a little bit more, but kind of on a usability scale with, uh, you know, smaller numbers, I, I caution the team. Like, yes, you, you, we have six people here and, and this is the feedback we got. Um, but in terms of creative direction specifically, like with six players, I'm not going to make suggestions uh, based on that. Yeah, I totally agree. And one thing is also interesting to consider is the relationship between user researchers and designers, because uh, let's, let's say if, if it's a company that the user researchers are kind of embedded in the design team, I think those discussion on creative directions uh, can happen can happen more more easily. One point to add here is that perhaps there is a, a relationship between the design and the usability and experience of the game, because the design can also affect, for example, the feedback which is perceived by the player. So 
that might be also something to consider here. So the design might affect how a player is perceiving the feedback, it could hide something a little bit more, or it can uh, highlight some feedback to some extent. Do we have any other uh, questions from the audience right now? I think otherwise we might move on to discuss a little bit in general about the guidelines presented in the paper. I think uh, before kind of leading into the discussion of general guidelines, uh, for me at least, I think one of the most interesting takeaways from this in the guidelines and in what we saw in our analysis was kind of the dichotomy between things that are noticed with a short-term play test versus a much longer-term engagement with the game. That sort of kind of emergence of things that simply will not come up in that shorter scale kind of usability play test at, at least was something that I found quite interesting simply because running longer term play tests and diary studies and like that with, with those you run into the complications of not being able to control the testing environment necessarily, especially if you're a, a small studio that simply doesn't have lab space available to have people consistently coming back. Looking at, you know, if you have a developer that's running on a shoestring budget where that sort of thing isn't feasible, maybe there's something that can be done in terms of uh, expert evaluation, especially to kind of look at assessing the long-term appeal of a game? The part that I probably want to put some emphasis on is that uh, like when working with developers, sometimes they have this misconception that, oh yeah, we did one play test on our game, so we should be fine, or we did two tests, uh, or we showed it to our friends and family, so we should be fine. And there are still many other questions that could have been answered uh, using different methods that, that we didn't do, or the designers or developers didn't want to do. So uh, I think that's the main takeaway for me that one session or two session with a specific focus, obviously not going to reveal all the issues uh, with the game. The type of test that's run for a game really does have to be specified for that game and what its mechanics are. Like how with game B, the test that was run didn't show the issues that a lot of reviewers had because it's a game that would have benefit benefited from a longer test it's it's really interesting how even though these were all indie projects and all the tests that were run were small scale in many of the cases that was still enough to to highlight the main things that um reviewers would have had an issue with i think one interesting thought uh could also be how much user researchers need to uh, kind of advise on different type of testing. So like, again, looking back at, at, at what we did in 2015 or 16, the focus of this test were, uh, were motivated by the developers. So they basically told us that, hey, I'm wondering about the tutorial of our game. Can you test that? Where now in retrospect, like I should have gone back and say, yeah, we test the tutorial, but do you want us to also run some tests to check on, on things such as level variety or game mode? So uh, how much do we listen to what the developer wants from us uh, to, to evaluate and how much user researchers need to uh, kind of direct developers in different type of testings uh, that are available? Uh I'm, a, I'm on an embedded team. And so regarding like the options, I, th I think this more like Mitchman, like you were saying before, has implications uh, for developer teams becoming more educated perhaps on options that we can offer. You know, like um, when you were mentioning, you know, longer term diary studies or, you know, longer play sessions or things like that. That's a very interesting point uh, in terms of educating developers because I think, yeah, I think that educational piece is, is is the key and maybe or hopefully this paper may have some contribution in data space just to highlight things that could have been identified uh, easily but didn't. Yeah, and I still feel like that's part of what's happening in game user research as a whole, right? Like we're still trying to kind of get our methods out there to more people. Yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, I hope I guess this at least sparked some interesting discussion with the uh, with the teams. Yeah, <laughs> the, thank you for your presentation. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you very thanks, much. Everybody.